And good afternoon. And before I introduce the invited lecturer of the day, I would like to acknowledge that today is International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So I'd like to congratulate all the inspiring, talented, and driven female scientists here and across the globe. In a field often dominated by men, may ever more women find their voices, home, and sanctuary in the science world. We made a video as a little homage, and we hope to extend our congratulations to all women in science. Nice. Just one second. Eu sou Carla Manski, professora na Escola de Química e pesquisadora no Átomos, especialmente nas áreas de absorção e de estabilidade de emoções. Olá pessoal, eu sou Ana Paula Palhares, sou pesquisadora do Laboratório Átomos na Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro e trabalho com interações intermoleculares de asfaltenos e equilíbrio de fases de sistemas de óleo vivo modelo. Olá, meu nome é Ingrid, sou pesquisadora no Atmos e trabalho com termodinâmica e cinética de formação de dados. Olá, eu sou Jéssica, pesquisadora do Atmos e trabalho com simulação molecular. Oi, eu me chamo Larissa, eu sou pesquisadora no Atmos e trabalho com modelagem e aquisição de dados experimentais para sistemas com tecnologia natural. Oi, meu nome é Vanessa, sou aluna de doutorado do Grupo Atos e estudo como ocorre o processo de formação e deposição das incrustações inorgânicas. Olá, sou a Vanessa, sou professora no Atos e trabalho no equilíbrio termodinâmico de sistemas ternários com termodinâmico, álcools e hidrocarbonetos. Olá, meu nome é Yamara e sou pesquisadora no Atos e trabalho com simulação molecular de propriedades termodinâmicas. A little homage. And without further ado, the Adams Group is pleased to have with us today Professor Eric Muller. He is currently a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the Imperial College London. His research work focuses on molecular simulation of a complex fluids, adsorption and interfacial phenomena, phase equilibria and thermophysical properties from atomistic simulation to the use of equation of state modeling. Professor Muller has over 180 publications between international journals and conference papers, which to date have been cited more than 5,000 times. He, is actually, he actually recorded his presentation, but he is here to answer all questions by the end of it. So once again, welcome Professor Miller. Thank you so much for being here. We're just going to start to share our screen. <laughs> just a little moment. <laughs> it's it's an awkward science. Thank you for the introduction. I'll be talking today about the SAFT coarse graining technique and how to use it to understand simulations of fluids. I will start talking a little bit about the context in which this presentation is placed. In general, different people have different understandings of what simulations is. Uh, simulations, the, the, the molecular simulation will depend on the point of view of the observer and in principle, in terms, uh, it will be very significant in terms of the time scales and length scales that we're observing in such a way that there is a nice correlation between the length and time scales, which can be approximated or thought about as being a ladder, which leads from the very small t time and length scales associated with the vibrations of molecules all the way up to the macroscopic behavior of plants and large clay, large systems. 
this this ladder, this relationship between the different scales is not a continuous one. We have at the bottom of the scale both ab initio and DFT calculations, which are very accurate and are able to describe the small details of individual molecules. But when we want to pass from DFT or similar types of calculations all the way to a description, atomistic description of matter, we find that the rung in that ladder is broken. And it's very difficult to obtain a very smooth way of passing information from one to the other. From the atomistic modeling in which we describe individual molecules and, and as, as groups of atoms to a coarse grain description, which is what this presentation is going to talk about, there are still links and there's still possibility of passing information. But from there on, it is very difficult to pass information from this molecular type of understanding of matter all the way to the higher scales. So unfortunately, this is a, a matter for another presentation. And we'll talk today about coarse graining force fields. So what is coarse graining about? The, the bottom example shows an idea of what we can achieve with coarse grain. By coarse graining, we remove the detail in the molecular model and uh, try to focus on what is important on the traits of both molecular conformations and energy which are important to find to look at the macroscopic observable properties. So in this case, we have a liquid crystal, liquid crystal, which is formed by a rather rigid ring, a large ring with a long alkane tails put around it. So instead of modeling atomistically, which would require enormous computational effort, we build a coarse grain model which has the general traits of that of that particular molecule and this larger coarse grain model is much easier to, to simulate and there's less force centers and there's orders and orders of magnitude of difference in the computational effort needed to model it and by allowing for that we can actually understand for example in this case the formation of very unique uh, liquid crystalline phases which are formed by the interpenetration of these large holes in these unique molecules. So of course graining is essential if we're looking at large molecules or we're looking at large time scales needed. For example, in the cases of polymers and multi-component mixtures, self-assembly of soft matter, it's indispensable. But there is a risk of garbage in, garbage out, because there is no universally accepted procedure or methodology to obtain the information for the coarse grain force fields. And this is important. You see, because integrating out the degrees of freedom inevitably results in a loss of information. And this has its consequences in terms of the transferability of the models. There is generally two ways, two approaches in which you can pass the information from, or you can add the information to the coarse grain model. The most naive or, or maybe the more classical way of doing it is probably described by the cartoon on the right hand side where you see a, an atomistic model of a peptide and the corresponding coarse-grained representation where groups of atoms or important parts of the molecule are grouped into other force centers. There are several ways to do this upscaling. And uh, one, the most classical way to do that is, to, is called iterative Boltzmann. And in the iterative Boltzmann technique, one attempts to match either radial distribution function or some other detailed atomistic representation of the model and and fits or or by iteration fits a potential a coarse grain potential which which matches that with the hope that if we match the radial distribution function or some other uh, property we will get a good representation a good overall fit of the of the force field force matching is similar in this case we actually try to match the forces among groups of molecules. Rather recently, the, the concept of relative entropy scaling has been um, championed by Professor Shell and employs a measure of, of entropy to, to obtain matches between the scales. And even more recently, machine learning has been brought into the equation of thinking, saying, well, maybe a machine is, is probably more clever than us 
and allows us to understand the relationships between these atomistic level details and the coarse graining models. Another way of thinking about the problem is a top-down approach. In this case, we look at the macroscopic observable properties and try to figure out what is the intermolecular potential that produces these macroscopic properties. Martini is the, the force field that exemplifies this idea. It, it guides the parameter estimation by matching experimental water octonal partition coefficients and other, and other similar properties. The Martini force field is, is rather simple. There's a, a fixed set of equal sized beads. The different energies and charges are assigned to these different types of beads, which themselves can be used to build molecules of different types. Our model is, is called SAFTS, which stands for the Statistical Associating Fluid Theory, is a, a different approach. It basically maps energy, size, and range of beads to expected macroscopic volumetric properties, and we'll discuss this as a focus of this presentation. I might mention that DPD, or dissipative particle dynamics, is also an interesting uh, approach, but does require a ad hoc fitting of the parameters to, again, to macroscopic properties. So the SAFT approach deals with the classical idea of how to build an equation of state. Usually, if we start with experiments, you would be interested in using a theory. Now, this theory, if the theory uh, tries to mimic the experiments, but most likely usually fails. And when that happens, one is not very sure why is it that it fails? Is it because the theory itself is, is badly constructed? Or is it because the underlying potentials or that the theory is based on are not appropriate to define, to describe the experiments. For example, if we were looking at a, a theory for hard sphere fluids and um, we try to use it to compare to experiments, in this particular case, no matter how good the theory is, it will never fit the experiments because real life fluids are hardly ever hard spheres. Here's where simulations, come, molecular simulations come in handy. Simulations can be used to generate pseudo data that can be used to fine tune the theory. In this case, there's no ambiguity with respect to the difference between the potential in the data and the one that the theory is trying to fit. So we can fine tune our theory using simulations. And once we do that and we compare it to experiments, then we can be very sure that the only difference between experiments and the simulations is the lack of our force fields to represent the reality of experiments. So once the cycle is complete, you can think about flipping the cycle around and saying, well, if we have a, a theory that represents well our simulations and we can use a theory to fit well the experiments, then immediately we have found a force field that represents the experimental data. And this is what the SAFT coarse grain model is about. Basically, we can use this, this cycle to produce force fields that are in agreement with experiments. And the interesting thing is in that once we have these force fields, we can invoke both re the transferability and the representability of these force fields. So we can use the parameters that are fit to one molecule to another set of molecules, or we can also use these simulations to explore properties which are not included in the original fit. For example, interfacial properties, transport properties, etc. The basis of the SAFT model is, of course, the SAFT gamma mi equation of state. This is a, a highly accurate equation of state. It's a third generation of the SAFT models. It's based on the mi potential, which is up on the, on the left hand side, top left hand side. The mi potential depends on a, a distance of approach between two molecules, a value of the well depth or energy or epsilon, but also depends on a range, which here is symbolized by the letter gamma. Different ranges change the form of the potential and allow the fine tuning to special to different types of molecules. Now the SAFT formulation is unique in the sense that it relates the macroscopic equation of state 
with an underlying force field. And the parameters for the equation of state are given in the top right hand cartoon, which again are the sigma, the epsilon, lambda, and the number of beads forming a chain. In the lower right hand side is actually the crux of the matter. If we take experimental data marked by the solid black points and we fit the equation of state, which is a solid line, we can produce parameters which reproduce this experimental data. These parameters are the same parameters for a force field. So we can use molecular simulations using those parameters to reproduce the red dots, which correspond to the equation of state, but also of course now correspond to the experimental data. So the first question is how do we obtain the parameters for the equation of state? And um, we've already given you a, a clue about this. An idea would be to fit the equation of state to experimental data. We usually, uh, we, we use in general, and we've seen that it's reasonably successful to use vapor liquid phase equilibrium densities um, and vapor pressures. Although we could incorporate in principle any property that comes out of the equation of state, like excess volumes, enthalpies, et cetera, et cetera, or second derivative properties. And another um, way to do that, and we'll discuss that later, is to formulate this in terms of corresponding states, in, in which case we would need even less data. If we use experimental data, here's an example of the type of fits that we can obtain. These are three components which are in, not trivial to, to model. In, in triangles, you see the attempt to model this using the Leonard Jones model. And you can see that no matter what we do, no matter what parameters we use, the experimental data, which are the dashed lines. If we use the Saft equation of state, we can see that we can fit the experimental data and the, the simulation uh, data fit spot on the experimental data and the equation of state. The me potential, which is the basis of the SAFT model, is actually a conformal potential, meaning that different sets of exponents, M and N, in the equation produce exactly the same result. So in the, the potential itself, what this, what this basically means operationally, means that we can fix one of the exponents in the me potential. Usually we fix the attractive exponent, N, here in this slide, to six, which tends to be a reasonable suggestion in terms of the London exponents. And leave as only as an adjustable parameter, the repulsive part of the potential, in this case M, which we have um, symboled as lambda. And this basically says that there is a unique parameter in terms of, there is one unique parameter, which is the energy another unique parameter, which is the size or sigma. But there's a third unique parameter, which corresponds to the range of the potential, which either, either lambda or alpha, and you will use these in the same way. So this suggests that the equation of state can be expressed in terms of a four parameter corresponding states or a three parameter corresponding states correlation. M signifies how many beads we have in a molecule and gives us an, a, an idea of the aspect ratio of the molecule. Sigma is a size parameter, epsilon is an energy parameter, and lambda is a non-dimensional, lambda or alpha are non-dimensional um, potentials which talk about the range of the potential. So it's, it's natural to try to match these two critical properties. Value of M would be basically given by the molecular geometry of the molecule. Lambda, we have um, successfully fitted it to the eccentric factor, which is some sort of measure of the difference between the potentials of the different molecules. Epsilon is very nicely correlated with the critical temperature. And sigma, of course, is very nicely corresponded and co related to the density of the bond. And if we can do that, then with a very small number of properties, the eccentric factor, critical temperatures, and, dense, and, and one single density point, we can obtain all the parameters for the molecules. 
And we have done that for a, a large number of molecules and collected this in a web cage called a bottle saft. There's a, there's a joke associated here with, uh, because saft of course means in Nordic, in Nordic languages means juice, where this is the, the name comes from. So in this, in this web page, you can enter as input critical properties. Um, otherwise you can enter by, by just simply names and there's a database of, of properties. But if you wish to, in, to input yourself the data, we would need three pieces of information. One is a critical property, the critical temperature. The other one, an eccentric factor, which is basically a point in the vapor pressure curve, a density at 0 0.7, the critical temperature, which are uh, the uh, liquid density, which again is just one point in the density curve. And with this information, we can obtain the four SAFT parameters that we would need for the, for the model. The quality of fit is seen here for the, for the case of R134A, which is a, a common refrigerant. The model molecule is, is modeled as two tangent homonuclear beads, M equals two. And you can see in the graphs, the predictions now for the, from the equ equation of state as compared to the experimental data and open symbols and the simulation data, which is the solid symbols. And this, as I mentioned, is, is tabulated and we have over 5,000 well-defined components for which we have um, parameters. And of course, we could just add more uh, if we knew some sort of information on the thermal physical properties to either fit the data pr directly to the data or to use cor a corresponding states approach. And the quality of the fit is, is actually very good. This is a, a very dense plot of the normal boiling point as compared to the experimental one with an extremely good um, quality of fit. There's over 5,000 points in this graph, although it's, it's not apparent from the fact that the, all the numbers fall almost one on top of the other. We're not completely linked to the SAFT equation of state. You could use the SAFT, you could use extensions of the SAFT equation of state use, to use exactly the same concept. In this, in this plot, uh, we are looking at cryogenic fluids, fluids which are at such a low temperature that quantum effects start becoming important. So we've taken the equation of state and added the Feynman-Hibbs correction to, uh, to take into account these quantum corrections. The Feynman-Hibbs correction also influence, influences basically directly the intermolecular potential and produces, in essence, a, a temperature dependent potential. By doing that, we can actually model mixtures of cryogenic fluids at extremely low temperatures with an accuracy which rivals both the experiments and we can, and the nice thing that we can do it with the, not only of course with the equation of state, but the important thing here that we can do it with the simulations with a force field that defines these mixtures. So how about other things like, for example, transport properties, interfacial properties? It's important to recognize that transport and interfacial properties were not part of the fit. And the fit is based on the equation of state so we basically only use volumetric properties for the parametrization. But the procedure is very, apparently very broad. And it's what we were basically doing is fitting the effective Helmholtz free energy landscape. So this seems to be an excellent idea to produce a robust optimized force fields, which can then be later explored, used to explore other properties. As an example, I'll show you uh, the observation that we, we had in terms of understanding high pressure CO2 water interfacial tensions. The plot on the left shows in black and white experimental data of interfacial tension as, as a function of pressure. And what can be obviously seen from the graph is that there's an enormous amount of dispersion, especially around the 10, the 10 um, megapascal range. And this is quite puzzling because all of these groups are very good groups with extremely accurate equipment. So the, this inaccuracy is, has, is completely atypical in, in this situation. The coarse graining model allows us to, 
to study large systems. And in this case, we studied the relatively large system at the conditions close to these experimental data points, finding the inter interfacial tension and density profiles for all these systems. And what we saw was that in the vicinity of around six and seven megapascals, the system passed from being a vapor liquid system to a liquid liquid system through a point that corresponds to the vapor liquid liquid equilibrium. And of course, at that point, seen a snapshot, which is seen at the top right hand of the slide, we see that we have actually, of course, three phases with the corresponding new number of interfacial tensions, each for each pair of phases that can be considered. So of course, what was happening in the system was that it, we're not looking at a simple two-phase system, but we're looking at a three-phase system. Hence, the characterization with a single interfacial tension was of course impossible. And that of course explained why there was a, uh, this, this very s big spread in the simulation in the experimental data, most likely because of the appearance of another phase in the system. Another example of how the of the accuracy of these transport and interfacial properties are is the results of the ninth AICHE industrial fluid property challenge. In the left hand side, you have the we have the predictions that come out of the SAFT models in terms of the interfacial tensions as a function of temperature for water toluene and dodecane. The challenge itself was to try to find the, to try to predict the interfacial tension of, of a mixture of these compounds at high temperatures and high pressures, for which the answer was unknown. Once the predictions were made, the answer, the experimental answers were disclosed and a comparison could be made of the different modeling techniques. I was very pleased to see that the SAF model came top in this, in this challenge, rival with rival and ring the very accurate atomistic and other types of, of models. Transfer properties are also reasonably well described. This in this example, I'm showing the self diffusion coefficients of rather long alkanes, um, sometimes considered called waxes. In this case, it's the diffusion self diffusion coefficient of C24, very close to its freezing point. To the left hand of the graph, we have the low temperatures corresponding to the solid, so the solid phase. And to the right hand, we have the fluid. It is compared against in the orange dots, which corresponds to a dozy NMR results, which are actually experimental data. The symbols in green um, correspond to the different simulation results, ones with all, with atomistic, fully atomistic models. And in green, we have the, the SAFT models. And you can see a very nice agreement between the DOZI and MR the simulations and, and our results. This was taken, you can take it even further to look at mixtures of these models. So this is the example, the output of a simulation of an A component alkane mixture fitted to a real Malaysian crude and the interest here was to look at the wax appearance temperature, which is basically related to that point in the self diffusion curve where there is a, a change in the slope. So we, we, we saw this change in slope, the, the experimental mixture in red um, sh matching very nicely to the NMR data for the fluid region and predicting an, a wax appearance temperature quite close to the experimental experiment to the experimental data. I just might mention that in these simulations of diffusion, if one is actually on the same plot, uh, one is quite pleased. You can actually see that the diffusion coefficient scales several orders of magnitude. So it's actually very hard. It's a very stringent test of the theory. So I've given away a little bit about how to uh, consider complex molecules. Um, the, an idea to, to fix complex molecules is, is that unfortunately we fit parameters to on a per molecule basis with homogeneous models. Uh, but there's no reason why one could not invoke a, a group contribution approach. And, and 
In this case, I'm going to show you, for example, the case of um, an, an example for a toxylated surfactants. A surfactant, as you of course know, is a molecule which has, which is polyphilic in nature. In this case, the toxy is, is an non-ionic surfactant formed on one side with e ether groups and on the other, which are hydrophilic, and on the other side with alkane, an alkane tail, which is hydrophobic. So we decided to take this molecule and split it up into pieces. The alkane part, we fitted these beads to the properties of different alkanes of different lengths. The central ether molecules, we fitted it to the different available ethers in, in, the, in the experimental data available. And the end group, which is basically a glycol group, we fitted it to the, to the properties of triethylene glycol. And what we did was assume, and here's a leap of faith, that by joining these, these groups, uh, the, resulting, the resulting molecule would have the correct behavior. When we build these heterogeneous molecule mo models, immediately we have to start thinking about the properties, the cross properties, the properties between these two groups. And again, that can be fitted to the experimental data from smaller molecules. So at the right hand side, you see the fit, the fit that we used to, to fine tune the triethylene glycol um, mixture by using the excess enthalpy as a function of the mole fraction. And these, these parameters, these dermogenic parameters were then transferred into the general model. It's very interesting to see that using these these parameters and without further adjustment, we would able we were able to look at the different morphologies of these surfactants in, in water. We went all the way from the micellar region to the worm-like regions to being able to predict lamellar phases and inverse my, inverse micelles, all with the same set of parameters. In the following slide, I'll, I'll show you a movie of what happened in our model when we put it into the water-air interface and put an excess number of surfactants at the interface. What happens, of course, is that we exceed the, the CMC or critical micelle concentration and the micelles will start detaching from the surface in order to maintain a maximum amount, a, a maximum amount at the interface. This this movie was a we were able to produce this movie um, in because the our models allow us to extend or expand our time scales enormously. A movie like this would be an, it would be more than a heroic attempt if we wanted to do it within all atom simulation. It would be very difficult both in terms of the size of the systems that we would be interested in, and it'd be enormously difficult in terms of the timescales. We're talking here about effective timescales in the order of microseconds, which can be explored with relatively ease and with the type of computing power that we, we can nowadays access. Polymers are a classical extension of these ideas. Its polymers are by their own nature formed by smaller groups in which each of these smaller groups can be fine-tuned to the properties of either a monomer or the constituent molecules. Polystyrene here is yeah, atactic polystyrene is a, a very nice example. Here we used a, an alkane backbone which we fit to the alkane molecules themselves and we decorate this alkane backbone chain with uh, small toluene molecules. But our model of a toluene molecule is, is based on two tangent spheres. So instead of using two tangent spheres, we basically, by trial and error, we figured out that using half a toluene molecule spread on, um, on each one of these beads would produce, a, on average, a model that was satisfactory. We placed this polystyrene model in both hexane and heptane as solvents, again, using coarse grain model for this. 
without any any general fitting, we looked at small mo small molecular weight polystyrenes in hexane. In this particular case, this mixture produces both an upper and a lower critical solution temperature, meaning that at high temperatures and or low temperatures, we see a phase split, while in the intermediate temperatures, we have a homogeneous mixture. To, um, we performed very large simulations for these systems, and it was also a challenge to try to understand what, um, what is a phase separated system and what is not. And a nice way of uh, studying this is by looking at local density histograms and, and plotting these local density histograms. So in the figure in the middle, in the blue figure in the middle, the question is if this is a one phase or a two phase system. By looking at the density histograms, you can see that there is a mean um, histogram size and there's some spread around the, this mean, but in general, there's only one histogram distribution. However, for the top and the bottom, it's evident that the system looks like it's in a two-phase system. And by looking at the histograms, we of course see that there's two peaks, one peak corresponding to the, to the pure solvent and another peak that corresponds to the polymer phase. Interesting result is that if we change now the solvent for, for heptane to, from hexane to heptane, instead of finding this upper and lower solution temperature uh, type diagram, we find what is called an hourglass um, diagram in, in which we have a regions, volumetric, volumetric fraction regions for which there is always a phase separation, but some others where there is a change between this two phase system and this uh, and a one phase. Again, I might stress that these are reasonably large simulations with reasonably large time steps, which would be very challenging, to, if not impossible to do nowadays with, with fully atomistic models, but produce, but are reasonably easy to do with coarse grain models, and most importantly, are very accurate and predict and predictive. Another area which we've been exploring the use of these models is for simulations of oil, of oil fluids of, and crudes. This is an example of our representation of a live crude. We have broken down a, a very a continuous mixture into 12 discrete components, which span from smaller light ends corresponding to gases, um, medium and heavy ends corresponding to other alkanes and and uh, aromatics. And more importantly, we've also included the very heavy ends, which corresponds to the resins and to the asphaltines. Both resins and asphaltines are polynuclear aromatic based molecules, which at least the latter of the asphaltines have the tendency to precipitate out of solution if the conditions of pressure and temperature are the appropriate ones. And uh, this precipitation is, is, is usually a concern for production of oils and is something that is in general um, of interest to avoid. Inter uh, one, of the, one of the things that we wanted to study was the effect that morphology of the different asphaltines had on their propensity to precipitate. You can see that there's two asphaltines in the slide, which I'll zoom in on the next one. These two asphaltines are basically almost isomers one of each other. One of them is, is what the top one is what's called an archipelago, archipelago model and the bottom one is called a continental one. And the difference Lie, relies on the way that the aromatic rings or the polynuclear aromatic rings are ordered. You can see that from this molecule how we've built the asphaltine molecule out of pieces. It's, they're, they're both Frankenstein molecules built from smaller pieces which we recognize when we look at the fully, dis, for, at the fully atomistic description of these molecules. It would be extremely difficult to isolate these molecules 
and to try to fit them to find properties of them, volumetric properties, which we could fit with the equation of state. So in this case, it's very obvious that this group contribution approach to these larger molecules um, makes a lot of sense and allows us to build molecules from smaller building blocks. We performed an extremely large simulations, large scale simulations in these systems and, and for some conditions, we actually saw the, the, the expected aggregation. Um, what we saw was that for continental, for the continental, or the ones we called bad asphaltines, the red ones in this in this plot, we could see that there was a significant aggregation, self-aggregation of these systems. While for the other molecules, the archipelagos, which are the same molecular weight, different conformations, would remain in suspension, and 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 would not really form part of these large clusters. Resins, which are intermediately small molecules and in some probably wrong theories um, are described as peptizing uh, or or agents agents that could solubilize or um, these clusters are seen to be very well spread and very well diluted in the system toluene is seen to form part of these clusters while alkanes for example are seen uh, to stay away from the cluster to perform this simulation with an all atom model would have required in the order of several millions of particles, something which would is well, well beyond what we would normally want to do for the time scales that would need that were needed for for the uh, to see the aggregation. I'd like to discuss also some issues that we know are happening with our model. Because our model, of course, is not perfect by any means. There's two things that, that at this point, that I'd like to just point out as, as significant problems that we've come up with. One of them is the premature solidification, which is enhanced by the fact that our models are, especially our homogeneous models, are, are made up of spheres of the same size. And this spherical nature of these segments, when, when, when we are looking at very high pressures, have a propensity to form a, a solid. And we have seen that this premature solidification effect, especially when we're talking about uh, extremely high pressures in the order of gigapascals or things like that. And uh, there's nothing we can do at the moment for this. It's just a, a fact that there is a little bit of too much symmetry in our model for this. The other, the other thing that is somehow missing is, a far, is the explicit introduction of charges or electrostatics. In principle, there's nothing uh, impossible about this. The issue is that it's very challenging to develop equations of state for these systems. Hence, it's very difficult to have the, 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 the equation to be able to, be, you, to use it in the, in the simulations. We have stepped uh, across this, this model, for example, when by looking at water. In this case, we employ average potentials, which implicitly include the charges. But we definitely recognize that this is a, a region which probably requires some sort of improvement. There's other things which are on our to-do list to improve on the model. And some, some researchers have been working um, on, on this. Uh, one is to look at or maybe less models to exploit the, the fact that the equation of state can describe molecules as fused molecules and to use that information to build more detailed uh, models uh, that, that could incorporate a little bit more of chemical specificity. And the other one, which I would, it's, it's, it's somehow shameful, is that the equation of state is actually an equation of state for associating fluids. It's called the statistical associating fluid theory. And uh, the information about how to include association terms is built into the equation. So nothing stops us from, from, from thinking about coarse grain models with sticky sites, which can mimic association models. And that can definitely be done. And it's actually work in progress. 
And another idea, of course, is to forget about the equation of state altogether, to bypass the equation of state and to use machine learning techniques to jump from directly from simulations to actually to the uh, correlations or to or experimental data or and back. Or you, that is using machine learning techniques to take a, a top-down approach to use experimental data and predict intermolecular potentials. So as a conclusion, I just wanted to mention that the use of top-down approaches relieves some of the fundamental issues associated with coarse grain. In particular, this, the, the washing out of information when going from a finer to a more coarse grain model uh, disappears. In fact, the SAFT coarse grain approach basically uses the integrated information contained in macroscopic thermophysical properties and obtains a surrogate or an effective potential to, that predicts these macroscopic properties. And by doing that, it ends up with a potential which is both um, has covers the three holy grails of a molecular model. That is the that it is transferable, that is representative, and that it's accurate. The use of of an analytical equation of state to make a link between these macroscopic properties and the intermolecular potential is key to the success. But also, it's it's the limitation because it, our model will only be as good as the equation of state that it's based on. An example of this is, for example, that charged systems, as I mentioned, are particularly challenging. If you go into our web page, into the molecular systems engineering.org web page, you'll see a list of the current applications of the SAFT force field and the, the systems that we've been using. I'd like to finish my presentation concluding, of course, that this this work is in not a one-man show. It's, a, it's the effort of an enormous amount of people, a very large group, and uh, most of the people that have done the hard, the hard work are shown in this slide. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor, for this amazing presentation. We are now open for questions. If you want to ask one, please enable your microphone or write it out in the chat. Our YouTube viewers can also ask questions. Who wants to be the first one? Questions in Portuguese will be accepted too. They they won't they won't have an answer, but they will be accepted. <laughs> <laughs> they can translate, of course. So, Professor Richard, can you enable your microphone, please? Sure. Uh, so I have several, but I was going to post them in chat. I have so many uh, that. Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't want to monopolize the whole, you know, conversation. If somebody else wants to go first, that would be fine too. No problem, okay. Richard. You can go first. Okay. If when you get bored, just just say so. <laughs> I'll I'll just mute you. I've got a little button here that can allow me to mute you. So don't worry. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, when I copy and paste them, um. It's not working. I'm wondering what I can do. I, I don't see, yeah, I don't see anything in your chat. Right. I somebody else asked. But you, can, you can ask yourself, no? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just get started then. Yeah, so, you, you know, at the University of Akron, they get very excited about polymers. And uh, the, one of the first things I noticed was they, they are very preoccupied with the conformational properties of polymers. So the, the variations of the radius of gyration with the 
backbone structure of the polymer and end-to-end -end distance and, and a whole lot of that. But I don't really see how that's incorporated into this coarse grain model anyway. It looks like just a fully flexible, freely jointed chain model. And, and so are you saying that, that they're just wrong to be so preoccupied that at least when it comes to phase behavior, and I guess that includes like the kind of lamellar structures that form in, you know, that, that everybody's so excited about with block polymers and that kind of thing, that at least for those kinds of problems, phase behavior, those, you just don't see any importance of those effects. Or did you, you, you actually do have a representation of conformational effects, but I just didn't see it. I, I didn't get that. Okay, so so you you you're you're completely right. You know the um, let, let, let's take a step back. If for for a small molecule, um, the the intramolecular um, the the inter the intramolecular uh, interactions like bond vibrations or or torsions and things like that um, basically have no effect on the on the phase equilibrium. Um, so, of course, if we use the phase equilibria to fit the, the potentials, um, we, we don't have that information. However, as soon as we start looking at chains and longer molecules, you start worrying about um, bending, you start worrying about radius of gyration and all these things that you've mentioned. Uh, for, for smaller alkanes, for example, the phase equilibrium is not affected. But if you start looking at things uh, like you say polymers in which we're talking now about bigger things, um, it starts becoming important. So there is something I didn't discuss here, uh, which is that uh, apart from finding the parameters for the beads and, 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 and the sizes of the beads, um, in many cases, we also look at the uh, average bending and the average um, uh, torsions. And we do that by looking at a fully atomistic models. So in, in simple words, we take a, 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 an atomistic model, we look at how this, um, these, bendings, the, 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 these bendings and these torsions would be represented in, in a coarse grade model, and we add that on top of the SAFT coarse grade model. So in the polymer models, and, 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 and probably one of the newer polymer models and the alkane models, we do have a bending potentials, we do have torsional potentials. And in the case of polymers, you're right, we have looked at um, the radius of gyration and, and all of these, these types of uh, um, metrics. And we actually fit to those to try to get a better overall representation. So, um, so you were right that you didn't see it because I didn't show it, uh, but uh, that not, not, not necessarily means that uh, we, we haven't put it in in some cases. Um, so now, um, Richard, your, 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 your list of questions actually did appear. Uh, so I guess the first one I hope um, I've, I've addressed. The second one says, how many compounds have properties in, in bottled saft? Uh, it's around five, it's somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000. It's just so many that no one has really bothered to look at it. And some of them are, um, so, some of the compounds are not really something that you would probably use uh, like um, molten sulfur and things like that. So, so that, that's why the, the, the answer is a little bit fuzzy. Um, bottle saft is, um, is, is actually an open web page. And um, if th there's nothing in it uh, other than a small correlation which has been published so we can we can certainly uh, we can certainly if you ask if you ask nicely uh, which you always do uh, we can send you the code uh, but there's nothing in it uh, other than a small Excel sheet uh, which uh, runs a few correlations which have already been published in the in the sister paper. Um, can I ask a follow up to that then? Um, yes, of course. So so what I what I I did thought I was asking but evidently I failed. <laughs> was, uh, you know, what we'd like to be able to do is to compute properties using this SAFT model. This okay, that's a different story. That's, a, that, that's the SAFT equation of state. But again, that, that also, that's, that's just a straightforward um, SAFT equation of state. 
if you want to go the equation of state, for instance, if you want to go the computational way, um, the bottle shaft gives you the input files for Gromax and for WhoMMD and things like that. So it depends which way you want to go. Right? Yeah, well, I guess I meant the equation of state part. Well, in, in this coarse grain model, are you using the, the polar terms or, or not? No, 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 no. This is just the vanilla, vanilla flavored uh, shaft gamma. Uh, so we're not we're not using those, uh, uh, nor are we using the rings. Actually, we're not even using the association, as, as I mentioned shamefully, uh, just because it's it's a, it's a first stab at the idea. To be very honest. Okay, and and that's where. So so can we download those five thousand parameters? Um, if you, or the no, you can't download you can't download them all at the same one, all at the same time. No. Uh, but I can certainly give you access to the to the to the backside, and you can do it. Okay. okay. If you if you want, we will just we can just talk, uh, you know, later, and and I'll just uh, I'll just tell you what we have and how you can access it. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, so, question sure. four was about the the hourglass phase diagram. Yes. Um, certainly, certainly. Can you, there's... Can you read the question, please? Because so the okay. question, it's not the too... question is, yeah, the question is the following. It says, um, I, I meant I showed in the, in the polymer, in the discussion for the polymers, I showed an, an hourglass face diagram, and uh, then one in which there is a, a lower critical solution temperature and an upper critical solution temperature. Yeah, and, and these are these are very classical. Uh, polymer phase diagrams. Um, and um, there is nothing uh, special about them that you couldn't do with, um, with an equation of state. I mean, if you have any, any equation, not any equation of state, but if you have any re uh, reasonably respected, respectable equation of state, you could probably model these things. Um, the point actually was not to, to model the, the, the phase diagram, which is just to, to point out the fact that we could produce potentials, well, intermolecular potentials, which could predict very well these, these thermodynamic properties. And um, the, what you want to do with these potentials is not to do the same things that you can do with an equation of state. You know, that's, uh, equation of state will be faster and simpler. Uh, but you can take this and now study other things like rheology, like um, interfacial tensions, uh, like uh, transport of molecules from one phase to the other. Um, some of these things which, which uh, on a molecular level uh, can, can be easily done with simulation, but with an equation of state, you're, you're running out of, you're rapidly running out of steam. So unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, when we talk about SAF, then it, it has both the connotation of the equation of state and also the connotation of the intermolecular uh, force fields. And of course you would use two different tools for two different things. Okay, but, but they would, they, do they give the same result? Uh, because in one yes. case you're kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. the phase diagram by a simulation. Yes, you, you, you would get the same, exactly. No, like no one would do a phase diagram of, of, of methane from simulations, if they can just run the Peng Robinson equation of state and do it immediately, that that's a, a completely agreed with that. Uh, but the nice thing is that since there is a relationship, um, you can use whatever part of the equation, whatever things that the equation of state gives you, uh, but then run away with uh, with the simulations. Uh, an example might be the asphaltines. The asphaltine systems are way way too complicated to be modeled. Uh, because of their heterogeneity and because of what the pi pi stacking and all these types of strange things that are happening, um, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that uh, with an equation of state. You could always fit parameters to get it to work, but you, you wouldn't be predictive in the way that the simulations are starting to be predicted. Okay, and then- the Can I add, oh, go sorry, ahead. Can, can I add a question on this? On this? Yes, of course, yeah. Uh, uh, you, you decide to, to uh, uh, see phase transition in, in uh, molecular dynamics, uh, and mm -hmm. you show some uh, distributions. So I wonder how uh, spread or, or what the fluctuation of each point uh, you get uh, in this distribution, because it looks to me like uh, 
well, not so easy to identify phase transition. And if you, if you, you, you use uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation, you may be, uh, uh, can confirm uh, that, that if you have, really have this phase transition. So uh, I, I don't know if it's clear, but uh, I wonder about let the me, fluctuations on this information. Yes, just, just let me show you, let, let, maybe the, 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 I wasn't very clear on this and uh, it might be possible with um, this uh, marvelous setup that I can share the screen and maybe I can just- Marlon, uh, can you help please? Yes, no, I can do that. Uh, let me see, okay. let me see if you see my screen now. Yes. Maybe you were, is, is you were talking about this probably. Yes. So yes. let, let me try to explain this with, with, take a few seconds to explain what we're doing here. What we're doing here is not really uh, seeing fluctuations in the system. What we're doing is here is taking this, this let's say this cubic box. And I hope you can see my, my, my point, yes. here, my mouth. Yeah. So, and imagine if we just break it down into small cubes. Yeah. And for each cube, we look at the density. And what I plot here is the frequency of that density. Basically, this is a density plot. The frequency of that density or that composition mm -hmm. as a function of the composition itself. Uh, so for example, for this red curve, what it says is that there is a, a certain composition associated with around 40% uh, of the, uh, of the in, in this case, the, um, the solvent. And there is another peak, which corresponds, of course, uh, to the, 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 the pure solvent, which is these areas. So what we're doing is basically a histogram of the density distribution in, in one snapshot. And of course, this is averaged over many snapshots. So this is, this is molecular dynamics. So, so we're just, we're, we just collect many of these uh, snapshots and just look at it. Yeah. The, the real question comes in things like this one, or, or, or maybe if you look at the next slide, in things like this one. Is this a one-phase system or is this a two-phase system? And, and by looking at it, it's not obvious. You know, and, 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 it's, and, and you sometimes get tricked into and because of the perspective and the, and the pictures. And the same thing here. Well, this looks a little bit more like a one-phase system. Uh, but how about this one? Is this, well, this one looks like a two-phase system, et cetera, et cetera. But this one I think is a good example of one where you wouldn't be very sure if it's a one-phase system or a two-phase system. Actually, this is a one-phase system because it has a single monotonic distribution. So, it, I mean, the distribution will look something like this one. But there is a spread, of course, uh, but there is just one, um, one distribution as opposed to two distributions or a bimodal distribution. Sorry. So I don't know if that is, uh, let me see, stop sharing. So Fred, did that did that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah, but I, I still uh, wonder about uh, if you if you fix a, a box, uh, you you may have or not a particle inside there. Yes, exactly. Okay. I, I see your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're completely right. Okay, you're completely right. Um, your your di distribution will depend enormously on the size of your box. So if, if, if you are, uh, let's say if you're very silly and you take just one box, you would only get one peak, right? Yeah. And if you, would, you, if you were also very silly and took a, a box of the size of, of, of one molecule, then you would get, you know, just a bunch of noise, you know, in and out zeros and, and ones. So there is a sweet spot. There, there is, a, there is a, 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 a middle size box um, where all, everything, all the histograms become, start making uh, a, a lot of sense and the noise uh, starts going down. Um, it's, it's worthwhile saying that these boxes are, are, are really, really big. And so it, it allows us to make smaller boxes which are still, uh, you know, have many molecules in them. And, and, and that, that, that fluctuation of molecules going in and out is, is small because the, the, even the sub boxes are, are also big. But yes, it's a very good question, and and, and you're completely right. Another it, it another point on... is, uh, suppose that you face something like that, uh, your box is here. So I I you see I you can see my screen. Yes, yes, sir, perfectly. Yes. So okay. so so what? Suppose your face huh? your your mm -hmm. face is like yeah. that, and your box is here. So sometimes you see the face, 
and sometimes you don't see the face. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So what what happens? You're again, you're 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 very, you're you're, ha you're having a very sharp, uh, uh, you you have a very sharp observation uh, on this. Um, when we do that, uh, you really get three three. Let's think about a vapor liquid with with one interface, and you do this 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 boxing. Uh, you will actually get three results. You'll get pure liquids, pure vapors, but you'll get a lot of interfaces. So your histogram will have one peak for the liquid, one peak for the vapor, and, and, and another little peak in, 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 at the different in pieces of interface you get for the different quantities. Um, now, the moment you make your system very, very large, of course, your interfacial, that, that area of that interface is less than less relevant as compared to the sizes of the other two. But that, that's, completely, that's completely true. You, you do get a little bit of noise. Uh, you can get a little bit of noise in these interfacial regions, which, which a trick again is to do bigger and bigger systems, bigger and bigger statistics. Um, and this kind of becomes, uh, you, you can also, well, I already took it out, but you can see that the, 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 the peaks are not perfect. Now they're, they're, they're yeah. curved. Mm -hmm. And that little thing is all these interfaces that you're picking. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Sorry, Richard. Oh no, the great questions. Yeah, they're very, very interesting. Uh, and and so uh, the last couple of questions or three, yeah, last couple of questions I had were about transport properties. So when you coarse grain your uh, potential function, you kind of lose contact with the exact time scales between you know the mass and the the accelerations and you know f equals ma is is not exactly well defined anymore. Do you know what I mean? In, in, a, a no. nanosecond is no longer a nanosecond if you're using yes uh, yes and no. You have to, yeah yeah yes and no. I I see your point. Um, of course, each of our beads has, has, still has a name, right? Um, let's say a, if, if a propane uh, or, or benzene is, is three beads, we can still assign um, a mass of, of one third of a benzene molecule to the mass of one of those beads. So in terms of the mass and in terms of the diffusion, I'm not so, not so worried about. Uh, but you do have a point that um, the interactions are being, of course, also smoothed. So in terms of viscosities, for example, you start running into trouble uh, because, for example, on the viscosities is more about the local interactions, about the small details in the, in the different molecules which have friction between them, et cetera, et cetera. And our molecules are just little sausages, which are kind of smoother and, and, and softer. Um, far away from far away from the point in which we have melting uh, or solidification um, that is high temperatures, um, these models seem to work reasonably well. We've looked at the alkanes, we've looked at um, simpler molecules where you we have the correct aspect ratio, and, and the viscosities are are amazingly good con considering they're just you know um, there is no information put into them. Uh, in terms of transport. Um, so uh, how, how we, we do start running into trouble, and we saw that for, for, the, for the waxes, uh, in terms of the uh, point of solidification. Because then, of course, all the very little details, the atomistic details are the ones that make molecules stack in such a way and the ones that make or break the, the melting point. So there's no hope, there's no chance that we can do that uh, correctly. And, and, the, and the, the, the moments we do that correctly, it's just, uh, as far as I see it, just random luck. For example, our model for CO2 predicts the correct melting point, uh, but it's just because our, our, model, our model of CO2 is two little spheres, which have more or less a correct shape and kind of pack in the same way as, as CO2. But again, out of, out of random luck, I, I would guess. So, so you need definitely much more for these types of, of things. But things like diffusion, for example, uh, are obviously not so strongly dependent uh, on, 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 these, uh, on these details. And for diffusion, we actually, uh, even for, for, we're usually very surprised to see how good the results come out um, 
and, and we recognize that it's, 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 it's a long shot uh, approximation, but it does probably say that the interactions and the, uh, and the shape and size are the dominant things in these. On, on a related note, when, when you take your molecular weight up for self-diffusivity, um, when you hit about 1,200 to 1,400 molecular weight, if you're, if you're plotting the log of the density times the diffusivity versus uh, the molecular weight, what you'll see is the, the oh, versus the log of the molecular weight, okay? So then what you'll see is the, the slope of that curve, which is the exponent of how it's scaling with respect to molecular weight, that slope will, will change from you know, negative one to negative two. And, and, and so they call that, that point where the, the slope changes the entanglement threshold. That's, that's my understanding, if I understood it right. And, and what I'm wondering is, does this model get that, uh, that, that entanglement threshold right for something like polyethylene, say? We haven't tried that. We haven't tried that. And it's a nice, it's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice question. It's a very nice thing to try out. I mean, we do have models for polyethylene and, and, and polystyrene and actually quite a few, quite a few models for, for, for polymers. Um, and that's a, that's a really, that's a really nice question. Um, okay. I would, I would, I would hope that at some point it would, something would happen because we, we're still having the correct um, aspect ratios and, and roughly the, the, the correct, you know, flexibility. So if, if it's all about entanglement and it's all about, you know, molecules being uh, longer, longer than what they want to be, um, it might be able to pick it up. So it'd be very nice to, to try that. And I'll probably get back to you. Okay. For, 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 I'd be very that. interested. I, especially, you know, yeah. if, if change, if that flexibility adjustment that you have, if, if the, uh, if it moves, you know, where that, uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, I'll, I'll, we, we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try. And I think it's a, it's a, it would be a very nice, uh, it would be a very nice a test. Um, I will I mention that, that we, we did look at that with the, the, the speed MD model and, and we, it, it was pretty close with that model. Right. Yeah. So, so again, you, you, in, in that, in that, in that case, in that case, you, you have the, um, the the aspect ratio and you have the correct interactions. So uh, it's it's if those are the causes of that, then you you have them in the model. So they might might just have to work. Yeah. So it was okay. encouraging. Although we were only able to simulate the um, the repulsive part of the potential. Yeah. And so we didn't have any attractive forces. But I think your your method would include those, and it would be yes. interesting to see. You know. Uh, Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there was just one more question. Um, oh no, that was my last question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you, Professor Richard. Does Does anyone have another question? <laughs> uh, I had a question, uh, actually, Eric. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Perfectly. <clears throat> uh, I wondered if if you or anyone had uh, developed a, a crossover equation with SAF to go so that you had an accurate description of the critical point. And the interesting thing to look at, of course, would be the second derivative properties like uh, <clears throat> heat capacity, isothermal compressibility, and so on which are measures of the fluctuations, the average of the fluctuations as you go towards the critical point, they diverge. <clears throat> and uh, it's always seemed to me that there should be practical applications of that. And we, we have one, of course, in supercritical extraction, we have isothermal compressibility going to infinity and we take advantage of that. But there are others such as the dual Thompson coefficient and uh, the various heat capacities that uh, would also you know, be particularly interesting. So um, the, w we're not using a crossover approach, um, but um, we are, we are uh, 
I'd probably say we are cheating in, in, in the following way. Um, in, in, the SAFT, in, in the SAFT version that we're using, we have uh, the first, the, we have, we of course use the TPT um, expansions and um, we use the first order and the second order uh, terms and we've calculated them um, exactly. When it comes to the third order term in the expansion, in the high temperature expansion for the, the, for the dispersion of the monomer, um, then we run into trouble because of course these depend on fluctuations which, which there's no way to, to capture. So what we, what we did for the third order term is that since we had simulation data for the full curve, including, including the critical region, um, we fitted the third order term to be able to match the critical region. So if you, if you look at some of the, some of the results that we, we show, let, let me see if I can share the screens in a second. Ah, that's um, why it, it's captured very well the critical that, region. That's, I always wonder the same. Yes, problem. yes, yes. So, it, so, so it, 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 you, you can see that, you can see that the, the critical region is yeah. captured quite well. Okay, much better than what you would expect with a, you know, let's say a, a more traditional SAFT, which would probably overshoot in, in, in this region. Yes, so, exactly. so we spent a lot of effort um, getting this as, 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 as right as possible. And, 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 and Keith, you're, you're completely right that this, uh, what this does, what this allows us to do is get not only the thermal the, 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 the VLE properties, but also the, the second derivative properties uh, very, very well. So I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a slide prepared for your question, which, which, which is good. It shows that we're not cheating, <laughs> we're not sinking yourself. <laughs> but um, we do have a paper, one of the first papers where we published this, and we published the Joule-Thompson coefficient, uh, the heat capacities, and, the, and we actually catch, you know, the divergence in the heat capacity, and we actually catch the, uh, the Joule-Thompson coefficients. Um, and this, I think we did this for CO2, and then later on we've done it for, for other properties. Um, so so you're, you're, you're completely, of course, as usual, completely right that um, you, you need to capture that region uh, in order to get the, the correct behavior uh, near the critical point, and more importantly, of these uh, second, the second derivative properties and, and further. Um, so, so that's so. So we do capture them, um, although by doing a little bit of creative, um, creative engineering around it. Right? So, on a related note, I, I posted a, a question in the uh, chat, but. I was just interested in what, what functional form you use for you know doing that fit for the A3 in the critical region. Is it something about it's the- just a, It's just the, a brute force polynomial. Oh, polynomial. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just a brute, as I said, it's cheating, fully, fully cheating with lots of parameters. <laughs> well, sometimes- uh, Because uh, of course we, we have, we have the, you know, um, we okay. have the simulation, you have the simulation data, so, so then going, uh, it, it's just the force fit to, to get the simulation data right. Well, but you know, the thermodynamics derivatives are important. And, and sometimes those polynomials, when you just start taking their derivatives, it doesn't come out right. You have to plan ahead. Well, you, you don't, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But uh, it's, you're completely right. You're completely right. But. But, but for you, it just, it worked. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, got lucky. <laughs> well, we already, yeah. We put a lot of terms in it, though. So. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a, poly, well, it's not really a polynomial. It's, a, it's an expansion in the inverse of temperature and things like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's, but, but yes, it's, it's just a fit. Thanks. But the point is, I mean, it's a very good point. I mean, if, if you don't get that, that, um, that third term, that A3 term, right, uh, you start losing out on, on, on a lot of properties. And that's, for, for example, what happens if you look at uh, the PC SAFT, for example, it kind of misses out on, on that region uh, for that particular reason, if, if not for uh, I don't know if you'd be interested, but uh, Joachim Gross and uh, Van Thies have have done some analysis for the, up through the A4 term, 
of the Leonard Jones spheres. Yes, yes, I've seen that. I've seen that, and it's not very far away from from what comes out uh, from. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, if you look at it, um, it, it's not that far away from what what we had put into the Seth Yama. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we saw that 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 paper came out later. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, I remember that. Nice questions. Yeah, we had a great discussion today. Yeah, may I have one question? <laughs> yes, yes. I don't know. Do you have well, unfortunately, my has, question please, is not in the level of professor question. It's like very basic. So if uh, is just wondering this kind of advanced model, the so-called advanced model, such as SAFT, PCA, and this kind of model. If you want to like learn it, I mean, be good at it. What what source do you suggest to us? Uh, because I'm sure there are lots of sources, books and things. So if you want to be good at it, what do you suggest to us? Um, Just a student Georgia's level. Book. Sorry for the student level of question. Maybe maybe Conta Georges's book is probably a good uh, starting point. I think I'd, I'd probably ask uh, both uh, Richard and Keith to help me out here. Um, what would be good good starting points? If, if you want to look at the equation of state, the book by Conta Georges is probably a good a good starting point. Yeah, if you want to look at simulations and things like that, uh, of course, uh, Alan and Tildesley is, is is the book to start with probably. Um, and, and, and that crew, there's quite a few uh, newer ones, but I think that one is easy to read and easy to start with. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thank you. Richard, you Thank probably you. would have another, um, you could, th th there's a book by thermo and thermodynamics by, by certain Elliot, um, uh, which you would probably <laughs> also want to have. Uh, um, that's, 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 a, that's a, that's a, that's a really good book actually. Uh, and, uh, and it actually has a uh, discussion on SAFT in, in it also. I start my reading with a uh, Gerb's book. And Keith, Keith, but, yeah, the Keith, both both volumes of Keith's book are, are really good too. Uh, but those are those 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 would be uh, hard on for a, a learner. <laughs> you, you'd probably would use them later on. And those are difficult. Those are tough books. Okay. okay. Yeah, in uh, chapter nineteen. Uh, of, of Elliot Lira is, is kind of a in development chapter. So we have permission to just share that with you as a PDF if you're interested. You we have it. here, we have in, the, uh, in our lab. Okay, okay. Okay. Thanks, Professor. Thanks for the nice uh, presentation as well. Thank you, you're welcome. Any more questions? <laughs> Are you okay? So the time is almost over. <laughs> I yeah. want to thank everyone for the discussion. And once again, thank Professor Eric Miller for being here and answering all the questions. Mm -hmm.